Space Marine Strike Cruisers. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and fleets of the Warhammer 40k universe. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. Now I shall get into the lore in a moment, but first, a quickie from the sponsors of this video. Definitely an audience-appropriate one this time. Coming to Early Access launch on Steam today. Warhammer 40,000 Warp Forge. The collectible digital card game with teeth. It is your best chance to immerse yourself into the grim darkness of the far future. You take command of a force of one of your favorite factions, the Noble Ultramarines, the Savage Orcs, the Soulless Necrons, the Baleful Black Legion, the Ancient Eldari, or the Voracious Tyranids. Visually stunning and a gift of the years, as there are some amazing voice acting segments, it adds to the immersion and makes the board very jealous. It has cunning and unique gameplay with warlords and differing combat modes, so if you intend to triumph, you must be as wise as you are vicious. This game is now available for download on Steam today, the 19th of October. So get in on the ground level, download it now. Man, if Steam is not your jam, you can also pre-register on the Google Play or the App Store, as it's coming to mobiles on the 2nd of November. Then you can play it directly from your phone. Epic. So go to Steam and download it today. Warhammer 40,000 Warp Forge. See you in there. And thanks for that. Ah, the ships of the void. Dark behemoths of pride and power. They are ubiquitous to most settings. Yet, as with everything in Warhammer 40k, they are dialed up to 11. And inexorably, they are the first and often last line of defense against the predictions of the unclean, the Xenos, the heretic, the traitor, or the neverborn. For there are so many ship types, classes, and functions in the setting, yet it is the Astartes fleets, the ships of the Space Marines, that are almost unique, for they do not take orders from the Imperial Navy. But for the very basics on Astartes fleets, let us lean on the newest existing wisdom, hot off the press in the new Codex for Space Marines, in 10th edition, just so we can get the lay of the land. To quote, the Space Marine Fleet Swift and autonomous, Space Marine chapters conduct their legendary campaigns across the stars without needing the aid of others. Each maintains its own fleet of heavily armed void craft, ranging from dagger-like escorts to enormous capital ships. Space Marines are superlative shock troops, trained and equipped to launch furious assaults that annihilate their foes, and so the majority of most chapters' void craft are designed to enable and support lightning-fast planetary invasions and punishing boarding actions. They possess large bays for launching armored dropships, boarding craft, nimble aerial interceptors, and drop pod banks. Though chapter fleets are compact, comprising comparatively few warships, even the smallest are tough, maneuverable, and possessed of considerable firepower. Furthermore, any disadvantage in numbers is made up for by the Space Marines' centuries of combat experience and hypno-indoctrinated tactical and strategic minds. These render them highly capable of swiftly assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the foe, as well as predicting what actions they might take. They are fully capable of maximizing the speed of their craft and their own innate aggressiveness to take advantage of the terrifying superiority they enjoy against most foes in the fighting of boarding actions. Rapidly moving into close range with enemy vessels, where heavy firepower is of less value, these ships can launch waves of lightning-fast assault rams perfected for the deployment of a Space Marine craft's most deadly weapon, its post-human warriors. When the Adeptus Astartes conduct a void attack, they maximize shock value, spearing in at high speed, unleashing torrents of firepower, and launching void-capable gunships and interceptors. After arriving in system, Space Marine vessels waste no time in striking at key targets. 
Defensive silos bristling with cannons are targeted and destroyed with precision lance fire or crippled from the inside by teleported terminators. Line-holding ships meet a similar fate, the arrival of the Space Marines tipping existing battles in the Imperium's favor or all but guaranteeing orbital superiority for Imperial forces within a matter of hours, if not minutes. Without skilled and well-drilled crews for these vessels, without skilled and well-drilled crews for their vessels, the Space Marines would be incapable of delivering the blistering planetary assault and vessel-purging boarding actions they are so famed for. Space Marines are too few in number to crew their ships and are too precious a resource to squander in such duties. Thus, besides a handful of Tech Marines and occasionally other Battle Brothers, Adeptus Astartes vessels are crewed entirely by unaugmented human serfs and servitors. Chapters recruit the former from their homeworlds, protectorates, and wider spheres of influence. Thus these serfs are highly motivated and loyal. While many perform menial tasks, a significant number are extremely skilled and experienced in the art of void war. These include pilots, many often fitted with high-end augmetics, crew shuttles and void barges. These ensure their post-human masters are always well supplied, ferry personnel where they are needed, or bring aboard visiting dignitaries. Others fly craft such as broadhead and Scythian pattern interceptors, which are incapable of atmospheric flight. They are dedicated to the interception of incoming enemy munitions and bombers to protect their ships. Tasks too important to ignore in blistering void war, yet too menial for the numerically few space marine pilots to be wasted on. The Hawk Lords, a chapter famed for the quality of its pilots, are known for passing on many of their learnings to their human servants who have saved chapter vessels time and again. Regardless of role, all human crew of Adeptus Astartes vessels are highly disciplined. Space Marines cannot tolerate weakness in any element of their operations. Where many chapters differ in how they regard their serfs, some, such as the Flesh Terrors and Marines Malevolent, have little regard for a great majority, seeing them as a resource in the same way that they might fuel or ammunition. In others, such as the Salamanders and the Ultramarines, the humans who serve them are considered to be of great importance. Space marines of these chapters have even been known to risk their own lives for their serfs. Space marines use a wide variety of vessels, each with dedicated purposes to ensure that they can dominate orbital battle space. Typically, these fall into one of three categories, battle barge, strike cruiser, and rapid strike vessel. The largest void craft operated by most space marine chapters are the Battle Barges, of which few Adeptus Astartes Brotherhoods boast more than three. Equivalent in power to many classes of Imperial Navy battleship and configured to support planetary landings, these immense vessels support a colossal dorsal-mounted bombardment cannon, macro cannons, plasma projectors, missile launchers, fusion beamers, and even exterminatus-grade weaponry. Additionally, they can deploy hundreds of Space Marines and their supporting vehicles simultaneously. In terms of protection, battle barges have banks of robust void shields and thick armor. This consists of ultra-dense alloy, adamantine and hardened plasteel edged with thick ferrocrete buttresses, ensuring that they can plunge through enemy fire. Chapters use a wide range of different strike cruisers, each variant shaped by years of tradition and differing doctrines. These ships can typically deploy a company strength force of space marines and their armored vehicles in a single brutal wave. Though smaller than battle barges, strike cruisers boast drop ship launch hangars, drop pod banks and teleportariums, ensuring that they retain all the same troop deployment capabilities. This grants a space marine commander all the flexibility they demand for any given tactical situation, and combined with a strike cruiser's inherent speed, ensure a few foes can escape the chapter's wrath. Smaller and more varied again than Space Marine strike cruisers are the Adeptus Astartes rapid strike vessels. These light, nimble craft serve primarily as patrol and escort ships and include Cobra-class destroyers, Firestorm-class frigates and Hunter-class destroyers. The most common rapid strike vessel is the Gladiator-class frigate, a ship which has earned a fierce reputation 
for its capabilities as a lightship of the line. Many a foe of the Space Marines has sought to bring about the destruction of a precious battle barge, only to be intercepted and gutted by squadrons of these vessels, whose powerful engines enable them to react swiftly to enemy movements. End quote. Now we have the generality of the issue. Let us be more specific about the subject of this entry. For today, we are to discuss the strike cruisers of the Adeptus Astartes, the thousand chapters of the Space Marines. Now many will know of the Beast of War, the Battle Barge, which I have covered before, links in the description of course. Yet these largest of vessels, the equivalent size of a battleship, may gain all the attention, but they do not actually do the main donkey work in the protection of the Imperium. Hard to produce and maintain, these relics are often millennia old. Not that that is a bad thing, for in the grim darkness of the far future, humanity is going backwards, not forward. Hence, as I often remind people, when it comes to the technology of the Imperium, older is better. And the battle barge is also unwieldy, as it is strangely a rather juicy target. Now many would believe that anyone in the setting would avoid a battle barge filled with psychotic transhuman super soldiers like the plague. Alas, these ships are icons as much as weapon or conveyance, and thus they are targets. For the enemies of humanity know that to deal a death blow to a battle barge will resound an echo of fear throughout the entire Imperium. The battle barge can field up to three companies of men without qualm or crush, Yet, it is almost a given that they require these troops to protect the vessel on which they traverse the back inky coldness of the void. Thus, to deploy a battle barge is a phenomenal display of power. Alas, this is almost a thing of a bygone age. For the Imperium of the 41st or 42nd millennium is light years distant from the needs of the Imperium of the Crusade era. The enemies of humanity scuttle around in the shadows, striking unprotected worlds in the dead of night. The human race has a hegemony over the entire galaxy, no matter how tenuous, so the needs of the fleet and armed forces are utterly different to ages of yore. For the battle barges and massed engagements involving hundreds or even thousands of marines are simply no longer required. At least, they were not before the coming of the Great Devourer, the Tyranids, or the Necron Legions. The needs of an aggressive, dominating, conquering army are utterly different from that which is tantamount to humanity garrisoning the entire Milky Way. The Xenos, or other enemies, do not muster in their millions and billions in an attempt to wipe humanity away in a tidal wave of all-consuming power. There are no forces presently active, apart from perhaps the Bugs and the Necrons, who could even hope to fight a combined fleet of the entire Imperial Navy. Hence, they do not even try. Raids, piracy, sector warfare, locality attrition. The armies of humanity are firefighting on all fronts, perpetually playing catch-up and attempting to defend an area that is almost outside of their capacity to maintain. Thus, there is a real need for swift and crushing power to be deployed as swiftly as possible to react to any incursions. This means that the Space Marines and their Astra Militarum comrades must only denote to any combat or conflict exactly that which will get the job done, and no more. Now many will state, why not just send massive fleets and armies, squashing all resistance swiftly and move on to the next one? Alas, that is fine for the assault, but woefully pitiful for the defence. For while a massive fleet would indeed win most battles, it is likely to leave a hundred dead systems in its wake. The planets who were only being attacked by Orc Raiders or Eldar Corsairs, or any other force, enough to destroy or capture the world, but not large enough to justify this hypothetical massive Imperial fleet from turning around to engage them. Like a prize fighter being asked to box with ants, the results are unimpressive. The slow erosion of systems and worlds is what the Imperium fears the most, for they intend to be eternal, perpetual. Hence, losing world after world is an erosion of the power base of the Imperium, 
but also a direct assault on its confidence. For there are only so many times that a list of lost worlds can appear on any report before it begins to affect the Elan of the fighting forces, let alone the civilian population. When Robute Gilliman restructured the entire Imperium with his Codex Astartes and similar tomes for the other wings of the Imperium, he transformed them utterly. Not just for the fragmentation of the Force, so as to negate the possibility of any one man gaining too much power and being tempted to unleash a second heresy, but also because he understood the logistics of the situation. The other Primarchs had been prosecuting the scouring, the attempted extermination of the remaining traitor legions. Yet, Rubute and his Ultramarines were tasked to hold and defend the Imperium, and he saw firsthand the ways in which the very nature of the realm had altered. The legions of Astartes were shattered, never to return to their previous numbers. The same was largely true of the Legio Titanicus. And yet, still, threats existed and would need to be faced. Hence, Rubute broke down the Marines into small, fast, autonomous reaction forces, the type of military that could react at the drop of a hat and head off any incursion with alacrity. Of course, Rubute was not to know how the administrative inertia of the Administratum Immunitorum would make these goals almost impossible to meet with any consistency. Yet, his pattern of defense was correct. And with that in mind, the emphasis on Marines being deployed in numbers was scrubbed from the equation. For Marines are hard-headed, and getting more than even a few chapter masters to agree on anything would always be a monumental challenge. And the use and deployment of the Marines had changed. They were now an elite force used to win strategically important battles. It was the Imperial Guard and the Navy who would now fight the wars. Yet the Marines had one last signal of their glory, one last honor that maintained their dignity. They were to be autonomous, even to the extent of having their own ships. No regiment of guard can move anywhere without negotiating with the Navy. Not so the Astartes. Yet the battle barge was too unwieldy. It was to the strike cruiser that the Imperium turned, a design used by Vulcan and his salamanders first. Of course it was. Because the other legions were at the forefront of the crusade. They fought in crusade structure and went from one victory to the next. Yet it was often the salamanders that acted more as a very large SWAT team. It was they who were generally held in reserve while defending the systems already taken. Now in most scenarios, it was the Imperial Army that did the garrisoning. But when an enemy went around the Crusade fleet, or the rebellion of an incredibly important world with high-tech defenses needed squashing, it was the Salamanders that were sent. Hence, they were far more accustomed to defensive battles and operating over a large swathe of stars than any other legion. Of course, Vulcan would see the need for the Swift Strike Cruiser. His Eben Drake design was completed for the scouring, yet became a backbone of the entire Astartes fleet from there on in. A ship able to take enough marines to any battle below that of a genocide level, able to support an entire company of 100 marines and all their support equipment, and facilitated to deploy the entire force within 20 minutes alone. The strike cruiser is a thing of dread, yet it is an appropriate response to most situations. A strategic strike force that decapitates enemy forces before they can gain momentum. 100 marines as the kind of force that can take an entire system from most adversaries. Well, most anyways. Now that we know the origin and purpose of these mighty ships, now let us discuss their makes and specific models. It must be immediately noted that the makes and models of these ships are not specific. Think of them more like weight classes in a boxing or other competitive combat scenario for there are as many variations as there are stars in the skies. So all of the following statements are generalizations only. And as usual, let us lean on some more of that existing wisdom. To quote, The Strike Cruiser. A Strike Cruiser is the second most common type of capital ship deployed by the fleets of the Adeptus Astartes. Often the arrival of a Space Marine Strike Cruiser 
is enough in itself to quell the defiance of a star system rebelling against the Emperor. The Astartes are quick to act if the surrender of the Emperor's foe is not rapid and immediate. Strike cruisers are fast, light armed starships, which mass slightly less than the Imperial Navy's dauntless class light cruiser. Firstly, strike cruisers must be fast, with a substantial troop transport capacity and multiple means for delivering troops to a planetary surface rapidly, whether that be through the use of teleportarums, drop pods, or launch bays equipped with Thunderhawks, or now Storm Ravens. Within the demands of these basic operational parameters, strike cruisers can actually take a wide array of differing physical forms, although most of them have become outfitted with the mighty Bombardment Cannon to support landing troops from orbit. Astartes chapters also possess widely differing forms of strike cruiser, each shaped by the chapter's long centuries of tradition and varying tactical doctrines. Fleet-based chapters also make use of vessels in the light cruiser tonnage class called a Vanguard cruiser. That is a refit variant of the standard strike cruiser intended to undertake long-range, long-duration operations independent of support from the rest of the chapter, often serving as reconnaissance or exploratory vessels for the chapter's fleet or as a heavy escort. Vanguard class light cruisers are less capable of undertaking planetary assaults like normal strike cruisers because their weapons profile has been optimized for ship-to-ship -ship combat, planetary exploration, reconnaissance, and boarding operations. The Vanguard class light cruisers come in three main patterns. The Mark I, armed with torpedo launchers, macro cannons, and launch bays for attack craft. The Mark II, which is armed with lancers instead of torpedoes. And the Mark III, which has become one of the most popular, which is armed with a bombardment cannon. The Grey Knights Perhaps the most elite and secretive of the Space Marine chapters, they maintain their bases on Saturn's moon of Titan within the Sol system itself. The Grey Knights starships are specifically modified in several ways. One is the hexagramic and anti-demonic wards that are built into the entire void ship from bridge to standing struts and every bulkhead in between, similar to those that are placed on the power armor and under the skin of the Grey Knights themselves. Finally, the landing and drop pod bays are enlarged to be able to deploy large numbers of space marines fast. The chapter surf crew of Grey Knight strike cruisers are all strictly mind wiped to prevent the possible taint of chaos corruption and are given a key word that will kill all the crew members on a Grey Knight strike cruiser and destroy the ship should it fall into the hands of the forces of chaos. Because of their advanced engines and warp drives, as well as their highly trained navigators, Grey Knight's vessels are the fastest ships in the Imperium and can respond to demonic incursion into real space long before other Imperial forces. Grey Knight's starships are also piloted by the most trusted and elite navigators of the Navis Nobilite, capable of steering the most efficient course through the unpredictable warp. The last variant is the Punisher-class strike cruiser, used by the Adeptus Arbites. Forming the backbone of the Arbites fleet, the Punisher is primarily a patrol vessel used to bolster local planetary defense force security, put down rebellions, hunt down pirate bands, and transport high-ranking Arbites officials. End quote. To be honest, there is not much more to add to this entry now. The strike cruiser, the mobile and long-ranged independent force transport for a company of space marines, is now the backbone of the Astartes fleet, and its appearance in any system outweighs its size by some considerable margin. Just think of it this way. It is not just a small cruiser with heavy armor and a scrappy soul. No, this is a conveyance that carries 100 Captain Americas wearing Iron Man armor. Vicious. I hope that brings it into perspective. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. Now do check out the links in the description for both the sponsors of this video, Warp Forge, see you in there, but also for links to my mythology channel that I run with my daughter, Lightbringer. It's great stuff if you like a good yarn. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun.
Toodaloo.